Hi everyone, Kier here. Today I want to talk about the tools that you can use to create a data art piece. So I would like to present like the most popular tools, I would say. And of course, it's very difficult to master all of them. I mean, it's basically each time it's a different job. So you can don't I don't expect you or me or anyone to basically master them all. But it's really interesting, I think, to present some of the different tools so you can choose the one you like most and, you know, start like, progressively building your expertise in one tool. And then when you like feel you master like the, the, the tool, you can switch to other tools or libraries and, you know, ex like gradually expand your horizon and create more and more intricate or complex data art pieces. Right. So let's start. Uh, I would like to start with the most, uh, I would say, uh, not basic, but the, it's the most essential tool for any data scientist uh, or any machine learning engineer. It's the JupyterLab notebook. So JupyterLab basically it's a, a Python uh, software framework library that you can use or basically you have a notebook so you can um, write experiments at the same time. You can write the code, uh, text, uh, math equation. You can put graphics. You can like basically have this full fledged IDE in your browser, which like talks to a Python uh, kernel in the background. And we use that for like, it's the most essential tool if you want to do data analysis, basically, right? So you can annotate the data set, filter some of the columns, you know, extract the values that you need. And there's no better like tool to do that than uh, using Python because you have all like the, the data science libraries. And once you're ready, once you, you, you like the, the thing that you create, um, you can export the data set that you're going to use to create something visually from the JupyterLab, for instance, or as a CSV file or as a JSON file, any file format that you like that you can import into other tools. So the JupyterLab is really, to me, my most essential tool. And uh, notice that the, the, their CSV file explorer is really, really fast. It's one of the fastest actually available. So if you have a very large data set, like 200 megabyte CSV file, I, the, the JupyterLab can actually read it. And if you try with that in Excel or uh, on like a Visual Studio code or anything, it probably will crash. So uh, if you don't really know this tool, please uh, take a look. It's one of my, my favorite and it's like really needed if you want to do any data science, data analysis work. So, okay, we have this JupyterLab tool. Okay, now we, we process our data. What can we do to create something like visually? So the obvious choice uh, now would be to use D3. D3 is the most popular. I think it's, it's the most popular uh, GitHub package ever created. I think it's more than 95,000 stars. So it's like the really like the like the ubiquitous tool if you want to create any kind of uh, data driven uh, visualization in your browser. So on, on the web. You have a billion of examples, so you can go online. As I talked in the previous video, now they also have this other website called Observable, where we can um, basically interact. It's like a Jupyter Lab notebook, but for JavaScript and for D3, and you can play with in, in the browser. And you have examples of like most of the, like all the different charts that you can create. So if you want to get more into data visualization uh, and go beyond the standard uh, Tableau, like pre-made charts or software that you may use, I strongly recommend that you learn more about D3 and how they basically they have their own way of thinking about data and, and their own API. But it's a, it's a really nice tool. You have basically all the charts that you need for maps, for area charts, for graphs, for anything. So D3 is, uh, I would say, one of the most essential tools for data visualization. Of course, you can you know play with it and create uh, data art from that. And because basically D D3 is a low level um, access to the, the API from the browser, from SVG creation to Canvas, and some you can also map it with WebGL. So you have all the tools that you need to create amazing uh, visuals, especially if you want to manipulate data. So D3. Now, next one, one of the most popular tools as well, P5 or processing. Uh, maybe you are familiar with processing. Uh, originally, it was a Java-based uh, uh, programming uh, like library and programming environment at the same time. They have this uh, web JavaScript version called p5.js. And it's the, the, as they, they say, it's the JavaScript library for creative coding. And you, it's, uh, I would say it's even lower level than D3. So you have access to 
uh, you don't have like pre-made charts or anything. It's more about how I can draw shapes, you know, over, uh, like and also some basic 3D primitives such as cube, uh, you know, cylinders, spheres, and so forth. And with that, you can create anything. A very good uh, resource for that is the Nature of Code. It's a book, and you can also find on YouTube uh, the Coding Train, which is one of the most popular uh, YouTube channel with more like a million or two million. Uh, subscriber, maybe more, a subscriber where the creator of P5.js creates tons of amazing uh, creative coding projects. So I would say if you uh, want to go more you know, uh, in the data art world or more creative coding in general, uh, please have a look at P5. It's, a, an, it's an amazing library, very simple, only two like main functions, setup and draw. So you just like prepare your canvas and then you can draw stuff on it. And it's also used to teach uh, coding to uh, people who are not familiar with programming in general. So uh, you have tons of resources online and uh, check it out. It's a really good uh, library. Next, we have my favorite so far, uh, cables.jl. So what I've been presenting right now is free so far, right? I'm going to go gradually from the free uh, sets of tools to the more, like the most uh, powerful ones, but oh, they are also pay you have to pay for them. So. Uh, one of it is still free and still in beta right now, it's Cables, Cables.gl. Uh, I'm, I'm working with this library uh, most of my time now. I'm also teaching data art workshops with this. I think it's, it's amazing. But instead of, uh, you know, relying on pure programming that we, have, uh, that we had before, where you have to write lines of code here, you have to compose blocks. So it's called a visual programming language. And basically it looks like this. So you have different blocks that you can pipe. Right, and the colors of the line depends on the uh, input or output of the different blocks, so you cannot really uh, mess it up. And basically, you compose this. Each block is a, actually a JavaScript code block, so uh, it's like pasting different, you know, bunch of uh, JavaScript block, and together, piped all together, creates a JavaScript program that works on um, WebGL. So uh, mostly for 3D stuff, you can create generative art as you would with P5, but it's, this framework is mostly used for to create uh, you know with shaders so uh, 3d stuff on on the browser it's, it can be audio reactive you have tons of different nodes I think they have more than 500 so far and uh, they, you can add your own if you wish so you have something that, that is missing you can add your own library and then you can start to you know create your own code blocks so you have reusable parts that you can use in, in your all your projects you can also share them with the community and basically you can construct over time, your own library of uh, tools, and it's very easy to reuse. And of course, to embed the results, so the, the the thing that you see here on the right, to put this on your website, and then basically um, that, that without having to you know uh, deploy the code each time, or it's like everything is packaged and ready made. You just have need to embed it on your website. So I strongly recommend that you start uh, looking at this library. I really love it. It's called Cables.gl. It's really amazing. Next, next we have Touch Designer. So if you if you know a bit about creative coding and generative art, you you know Touch Designer, which is like the leading tool for real time graphics. It is used everywhere in the industry for um, I don't know like big shows. If you want like like live visuals, museum ex exhibition, uh, you want to control lasers, you want to do uh, projection mapping. Uh, on very like big screens or like different weird uh, shape uh, like objects, Touch Designer is the way to go. It's very powerful. It's written in C++, but the mostly like the, the API, the code that you, uh, it's also node based and the code that you use inside the, the, the software is in Python. So you can also, going back to the first tool that we talked about, try to export some of the things like in, in Python for the, all the data science part and then read it in, uh, into Touch Designer and try to you know start to map and uh, create amazing visual. The interface looks like this. So it's basically the same. Instead of having the nodes from uh, top to bottom here, it's from left to right. And you, have, you compose the nodes and you have also preview. You can preview uh, some of the nodes. And um, uh, so it's weird, right? It, does, it doesn't really look anything like, like if you are familiar with D3, P5 or programming in general, this is a completely new paradigm, exactly like, like cables, right? So you have to learn and like change the way you think so you can work with like node-based visual programming. But once you learn how to do that, 
the power that you have is uh, is insane because you don't need to go back to the actual implementation and you can start to get like, getting creative with the nodes that you know and you can you know compose them it's very easy to okay go on one part and if you don't like it you go to the other part you can experiment very easily and whereas whereas if you code you have to go always go back to the like the lowest level of you know closer to the machine and it's um, sometimes you can you can get stuck in the programming part instead of you know getting stuck in the visual uh, in creative part so uh, like this is why most of the more, like all the tools the more advanced tools switch to this node visual uh, like node based programming instead of you know relying on very cunning low level stuff uh, because it it, it basically allows to to be more expressive so if you don't really know this tool, check it out. It's by Derivative. It's called Touch Designer. It's very famous in the community. And finally, not finally, like almost finally, my, my, my favorite tool, um, which I would say is the most difficult tool I've ever used. And it's used everywhere. Uh, if you watch any movie where you have visual effects, this is basically made with Houdini. If you have any destruction, uh, you know, pyro, so like flames or water, uh, something like anything that is a Hollywood uh, blockbuster uh, is using Houdini, which is like one of the most advanced tools there is. You have different kinds of solvers uh, for constraints, for cloth, for crowds, for terrain, for uh, to export to video game assets and everything. And uh, basically the interface looks like this. And surprise, it's also node based. You can code uh, in, they love this wheel C++ uh, like language, but it's also in Python, and you can import your data very easily. Now, the only drawback with Houdini, there is one drawback. It's the most powerful tool I know, but it's only to create uh, assets, so like things that you can export and load into another 3D uh, software, or to export to videos, because this is not a real-time tool. So you cannot do any kind of interactive data art or data visualization with Houdini. Basically, you have a renderer, and then you you basically create frames, right? Images, and then you assemble all the images, and you have a movie. You can also create assets, so like meshes uh, and shapes, and then you can export them and read them into Touch Designer, for instance, and start to play with them in real time. Houdini is not for real time, but it's the most powerful software that that you can find uh, on in this uh, like category VFX. It's also the most expensive one. So depending on whether you're a student or not, but or how much money you make for your studio, uh, you have to pay, and the full license price can go up to five thousand uh, dollars, I think, per year if you want to have like the full VFX stuff. So it, it starts to get very expensive if you just want to play around. But if you're a student or if you're indie, so meaning you you make less than a hundred thousand bucks per year, it's very cheap. It's I think it's like uh, two hundred or five hundred uh, dollars. You can depend on on whether you had edu education or not. But it's, so you have to pay and you have to learn it and it's very difficult to learn. It's not very difficult, but it's so big, it's so wide that you can spend a lifetime, you know, uh, learning each of like the different parts of the software. Some people are actually specialized in only uh, lighting, right? They only do lights. Some other only create terrains for video games, for instance. Th some other people only work with crowds and they, they, and they, you know, they create in all the video games or in the movies we have very large crowds. They don't pay any actors, right? They are created by uh, computer graphics. So this is something that they do. So you have to, to specialize, but n having an idea of how this whole software works really expands your horizon and you know you basically progress in the, uh, in the way you think in 3D and visually, I would say in general. And I would like to conclude this video with the, uh, like an, an essential tool, but it's so essentially that I almost didn't you know, put it in the, the list. It's like having this plain old Adobe Photoshop. I use it all the time, especially if you create static images and you need to print them uh, and you want to do color correction, there is no better software than Photoshop to do that, right? Especially, for instance, if you want to print, most printers online, they will ask you for CMYK, so instead of having your image in RGB mode, they will ask you for this CMYK mode because the printer, they work differently, so you can test proof, see if the color matches, and you know, make all the adjustments that you need uh, before sending to the printer, for instance. So having Photoshop in your toolbox, uh, it's like it's really essential. But it's not, of course, if you want to create the visual, I would not recommend then doing this by hand. We try to, do, to be data-driven, so any other software that I presented should do the, the trick. So 
I hope that you like this video. I would like to, if you guys want me to detail one of them, uh, I will do with, with pleasure. What I would like to do in the future is start with describing and playing with cables because I really like this software and because it's in your browser, it's very easy to embed it, you know, play with data viz and data art. So I will try to make some of the videos uh, to get you started if you are really uh, like a beginner, start from the beginning, like very basic stuff and progress as the, the channel evolves. So let me know if you have any questions in, in the comments. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next one.